you've been blessed today by the worship, let me hear you say amen. amen. It's always a privilege to come into the house of the Lord, to be able to share in and participate in the praise and in the worship. It means that we have lived another week. We are another week closer to eternity. And so there is much to give thanks. Our hearts go out to the Ali family and to the Honore family today. I want to encourage you to please continue to lift them up in prayer, um, even as they are preparing and making arrangements to travel, that God will not only comfort their hearts, but give them traveling mercies. Today, we are not only celebrating a baby dedication, we're celebrating baptism as these candidates prepare to give their hearts to the Lord. And I want to just congratulate them for the decision that they have made. And I want them to know that this is the best decision that you have ever made. We're also celebrating Father's Day. And, um, you know. I want, to, I want to thank all of those who are responsible for the box, the box, that all of the men received today. Men, I want you to help me to express our gratitude by saying after me, I am a Kingsman. Yeah, I think you can do a little better than that, so let's try that again. We really want to, to uh, let everybody know that we are really very thankful and that we are impressed by the lengths to which they have gone. I am a Kingsman. I am a All right, thank you. It's good to hear the sound of those men's voices today. Uh, when I think about Father's Day, I think about my own father and his dedication and commitment to our family, but I also reflect it on myself as a father. I have two children, my daughter is 33 and my son will be 30 next month. And fatherhood was uh, and has been very special to me. From the time my daughter was nine and my son was six, I raised them as a single parent. Uh, working, teaching, going to, going to school full time in a, a, a PhD program and um, I, I look back and don't really know how I got through but I'm so proud of uh, my children and I'm very thankful for what God has done in them and what he is doing through them so my hats go off to all of the fathers today I want to encourage you um, one thing my mother told me that I will never forget, she told me, always be kind to your children. There's a world out there that is mean. But when your children are around you and when they are at home, they need to sense your kindness and your love to help them to know that there's no place like home. We're also celebrating Juneteenth. For those of you that may not know, Juneteenth is a holiday celebrated on the 19th of June. It commemorates the emancipation of enslaved people, Africans in the US. The, first, the holiday was first celebrated in Texas, where on that day, June 19th in 1865, in the aftermath of the Civil War, enslaved Africans were declared free under the terms of the 1862 Emancipation Proclamation. So I want to encourage you to read and to study and to understand the significance of that holiday. I will not here unpack it today, but I do want to wish all of you happy Juneteenth. Thank you. 
So as we begin our message today, it's appropriate that I recap the main points from the three previous messages in this series entitled, From Aspiration to Application, Holiness and the Human Dilemma. Holiness and the Human Dilemma. So the first thing I'd like to remind you of is that holiness goes beyond moral purity. Not only does it mean being set apart, it also means purposeful. Everything that Elohim created is set apart and purposeful, even if you don't understand it. Secondly, the holiness of Yahweh alone defines the nature of true love. And therefore, true love in a world that is under the curse of sin balances justice with mercy and grace. If somebody does not understand the relationship between love and and holiness, they can love you, but they cannot love you with a godly love. All those of you who are unmarried, say amen. We're going to talk more about that later on in this series. Human love, number three, human love, human conceptions of love, that is love defined and measured by human standards, and human social constructions are flawed and irreconcilable with holiness and divine love and are therefore irreconcilable with God because God is love. Number four, dismissing or ignoring the holiness of Yahweh results in measures of love, good, beauty, and truth that are socially constructed humanistic standards. These standards, well intended though they may be, lead inevitably and ultimately to destruction. In other words, it is possible to exercise and experience passion, connection, commitment, empathy, sympathy, Dedication, loyalty, caring, affection, compassion, security, affirmation, and acceptance. But if these attributes of love are not rooted in a divine conception of love that is predicated on the holiness of God, they will supplant the worship of the creator with the worship of the creature. Now, if there are broken marriages and broken relationships, this is why. Should I read that paragraph again? Let me, let me read that again. I'm, I'm, I haven't even gotten to my text yet. Okay, so it is possible to exercise and experience passion, connection, commitment, Empathy, sympathy, dedication, loyalty, caring, affection, compassion, security, affirmation, and acceptance. But if these attributes of love are not rooted in a divine conception of love that is predicated on the holiness of God, they will supplant the worship of the creator with the worship of the creature. The creature inevitably in a human form of love will demand that which belongs alone to God. That's the reason why there are all of these breakups, all of this frustration, because we haven't figured it out. Humans created, humans created beings can only have life and existence on their own terms and at the expense of their extinction. 
Let me say that another way. If you're living in this life so that you can get what you want, it will destroy you. You can only have life and existence on your own terms at the expense of your destruction. This is the question raised by the late Christian apologist, Dr. Ravi Zacharias, in his book entitled, Can Man Live Without God? And the answer is unequivocally, no. Not only can you not live without him, you cannot establish your own rules and your own standards of life. Today, I would like to add to the three previous installments in this series a fifth point. The fifth point is simply this, that holiness is Yahweh's objective for humanity and that the development of our cognitive, emotional, physiological, and spiritual faculties is a part of the redemptive process, a preoccupation that will span eternity. Our text for today is 1 John, the second chapter, verses 1 through 3. The aged apostle who wrote these epistles sometime around the year 95 AD, the very last books of the Bible written, writes, See how great a love the Father has given us that we would be called the children of God. And in fact, we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope set on him purifies himself or herself, I might add, just as he is pure. The literal Greek translation of the last verse actually reads, and all having this hope in him is purifying himself just as he is pure. Holiness is Yahweh's objective for humanity and the development of our cognitive, emotional, physiological, and spiritual faculties and is a part of the redemptive process a preoccupation that begins here on earth and will span eternity. Let's pray. Father, as we present your word today, I pray that you will speak to our hearts. Help us to see the heart and the manner of love that the Father has bestowed on us. And let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and our redeemer. Amen. To make the case, I would like to insist that nowhere in the Bible do we read that Eve was tempted. But we do read that she was deceived. I want you to stay with me on this journey. If you look at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, and 1 Timothy 2, verses 13 and 14, it becomes clear. Even in passages that appear to imply that Eve was tempted, critical scrutiny reveals that in the absence of sin prior to the fall, Ha-Adam, that is Adam and Eve, could not be tempted. There was nothing in them to respond to temptation. Temptation is a post-fall 
phenomenon, not a pre-fall phenomenon. It came after sin and not before sin. By definition, temptation is the wish to do or have something that you know you should not do or have. Thank you, Cambridge English Dictionary. It is the desire to do or have something that you know is bad or wrong. Thank you, the Oxford Advanced Learners Dictionary. So from Cambridge to Oxford, from Oxford to Cambridge, you now know the definition of temptation. In each definition, the words wish and desire describe a predisposition that is foreign to sinless beings. Neither Adam nor Eve were created with a sinful nature. They had no propensity, proclivity, or predisposition to sin. This immediately raises questions about the language used in the King James Version and other Bible translations that seem to suggest that Eve was tempted. Notice what the King James Version says. And I'm reading from Genesis 3 and verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired... That's in italics in any good Bible. To make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also to her husband with her and he did eat. James the apostle addressing the subject of post-fall temptation writes, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. James 1, 14 and 15. Using the imagery of mammalian reproduction, James likens lust to an egg and temptation to sperm. But prior to sin, there was no egg. There was nothing in her Adam, nothing in Eve to be fertilized. From the biblical perspective, temptation requires a fallen nature, whereas deceit does not. This distinction is necessary because it safeguards the untainted moral nature from the liabilities of the fallen nature. The unfallen nature and the fallen nature are different. Jesus, for example, had an unfallen nature. He bore in his physical bodies the liabilities of fallen humanity, but his moral nature was unfallen. He was without sin and declared, the devil has nothing in me. In explaining this, one of my favorite Bible commentators writes, temptation has only power because there are some principles in us which accord with the designs of the tempter and which may be excited by presenting corresponding objects until our virtue be overcome. Where there is no such propensity, temptation has no power. As the principles of Jesus were wholly on the side of virtue, the meaning here may be that though he had the natural appetites of men, his virtue was so supreme that Satan had nothing in him which could constitute any danger that he would be led into sin and that there was no fear of the results of the conflict before him. From the commentator Albert Barnes. This distinction reaffirms that though fully formed at creation, the story of the fall presupposes that humanity was originally in a state of ignorant innocence. Follow me. Rather than intellectual perfection. 
And it provides some insight into how that ignorant innocence resulted in the sin of Adam and Eve. In other words, how could perfect beings, fresh from the Creator's hand, sin? It may shock some of you that the Bible does not even state that Eve was tested, but affirms that she was deceived, she was tricked. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, the Apostle Paul writes, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his trickery, your minds will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And in 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14, he writes, For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a wrongdoer. The Greek text literally states, because Adam was first formed, then Eve, and not Adam who was cheated, but the woman, having been cheated, has come into transgression. The word cheated is even more accurate than the word deceived, because it implies that Satan exploited a vulnerability Allow me to suggest that on the basis of the text of 1 Timothy 2, 13 and 14, Satan had insider information. He knew something about Ha Adam, Adam and Eve, that allowed him to take advantage of them, to cheat them. Now, to cheat is to act dishonestly or unfairly in order to gain a perceived advantage. People who cheat think that they're getting ahead. Can I park here for a minute? I'm not going to. Not today. But I'm going to get to it. People who cheat believe that they are gaining an advantage. Being cheated and being tempted are two different things. They are worlds apart. What is it that could possibly have allowed a perfect and unfallen woman to be cheated out of her conditional immortality? What could have caused her to be taken advantage of? Parenthetically, Adam, the man, was not deceived and ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with full knowledge. But what did Satan know? that allowed him to exploit Eve initially, but ultimately both Adam and Eve. Allow me to suggest that though uh, complete at their creation, Adam and Eve's physical, mental, and spiritual faculties were designed by our creator to be developed through their employment and their engagement with each other and with their physical environment. That is one unalterable life of human development that has not changed. If you look at human development, that is true even now. We, we, we mature, we grow as a consequence of our social interactions and our interactions with our environment. That has not changed. Adam and Eve were created holy. They were set apart for a purpose, but their holiness was designed to evolve, to mature, to grow. The evidence seems to suggest that cognitive and socio-emotional development are in, uh, in integral expressions of Yahweh's holiness because holiness is not only being set apart, but it is being set apart for a purpose. Holiness is purposeful. And the process of human cognitive and socio-emotional development are consistent with the maturation of all other life forms. No living organisms emerge fully formed. They all develop and or evolve in relationship to their environments. 
We are constructed in such a way that our human development is dependent on our internal and innate biological makeup in its interaction with the external environment in a symbiotic relationship with our cognitive, emotional, and spiritual development. Adam and Eve were to develop and to mature into their cognitive and socio-emotional prowess over time. There was no shortage of time in a world free from sin. So based on the evidence, it appears that this is the vulnerability that Satan exploited. This is what he took advantage of. Knowing that they were at a formative stage in their cognitive and socio-emotional development, he used this information to cheat Adam and Eve out of their perfect life, out of their conditional immortality, out of their connection to their creator, out of their habitat in paradise by offering, uh, by, by offering Eve accelerated development accelerated development your eyes will be opened which turned out to be arrested development dying you shall die consequently Adam and Eve were no longer holy they were no longer set apart and the purpose defined by Elohim's perfect will was replaced by the purpose defined by his permissive will Their sin notwithstanding, verses such as our text for today, 1 John 2, verses 1 through 3, and Revelation 21, verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, and 1 Corinthians 13, 11 through 12, seem to imply our continuing development. Stay with me, church. It is for this reason that despite the almost singular emphasis on moral purity, when we talk about holiness, we cannot overlook or ignore purposefulness, which addresses the fundamental existential questions for each one of us, why was I born? I don't mean to get philosophical, but this is a foundational existential question. Why was I born? And if you've never put two and two together, so much of the senseless violence in our world goes back to a complete disregard of the holiness of God. More specifically, a loss of meaning that results from purposelessness. In a world where people do not understand that they are born into this world for a purpose, life has little or no meaning. Life is cheap. Life is transitory. The devaluing of the sacredness of human life is a direct consequence of rejecting the holiness of God. And the fact that everyone and everything that he has created is set apart and purposeful. I told you last week that the set-apartness and the purposefulness of Elohim's creation is not dependent on our understanding of it. But God forbid that you run into people who are ignorant of this. You better protect your life. Life is holy. And the holiness of Yahweh is in itself eternally purposeful. One of the reasons why people raise the question as to what we'll be doing in eternity is that they are, they are unclear about the nature of holiness and the nature of purpose in relation to holiness. What will we be doing? I'm going to be bored just going up to heaven, sitting on a cloud, playing a harp. Right? That, that, that's the way that we've come to conceptualize it. Some people get up every day and are sick of going to the same job over and over and over and they cannot conceive of what life in eternity will be like. 
with a creator whose knowledge is infinite and creatures that are made in his image whose development has been arrested by evil, it should come as no surprise that the full use of our faculties are as yet to be realized. Eternity is the context in which our maturation will ensue. Our cognitive, emotional, physiological, and spiritual faculties will far exceed anything that we might ever have imagined on earth. But it begins here, and it begins with your decision to share in the life of God. I'm going to talk about this in the next installment of this message. But it has been very difficult for some of us to even grasp what it means to be so identified with Christ that you rule and reign with him. Some of us have failed to grasp what it means that through the mysterium tremendum, as the Latin scholars put it, he became one of us. Some of us have failed to grasp what it means to become kings and priests. A, 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 a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Some of you would think that I have lost my mind if I told you that a part of our salvation is actually partaking of the life of the infinite creator. I want to say that again because I know some of you can't even hear that right now. It was Paul in, I guess, 2 Timothy, he told us that, that God dwells in immortality. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the word and the word was now, if he becomes like you so that you become like him, who do you become like? See, some of you don't believe that because, because nobody has ever really taught you that or helped you to understand the meaning of having a life that measures with the life of God. If you have a life that measures with the life of God, you don't only see the future. You see the past like the present. I mean, all the way back to creation. You see, like as was read in the, in the, in the, in the scripture today, from, you, you begin to see from everlasting to everlasting. See, so when we start talking about what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, if you don't sit down and think about the implications of that, it'll go right over your head. Why would God make us like him through Christ our Lord? Why would, he, why would he allow us fallen, sinful beings to partake of eternity and to, to, to look into the eternal realities? The Bible says that angels desire to look into these things, but God said, hold on, it's reserved. So that's the manner of love that he has bestowed on us. And we're going to explore that in the next installment of this series. But today, I just dropped by to tell these baptismal candidates here that you are about to enter into the life of God. Listen, I just want to give you some traveling instructions. There are a lot of people in here who have given their hearts to the Lord. And it doesn't mean that they are perfect. It doesn't mean that they don't sin, as a matter of fact. So you will still have your struggles and your challenges. But what Jesus said to his disciples, I want to say to you, but I want to say it in a way that you can understand it. He said, look, y'all don't trip. 
Y'all, that's the JCC version. Y'all don't trip. <laughs> don't trip. I've overcome the world. Huh? Don't trip. I've overcome the world. You'll have your ups. You'll have your downs. You'll have your challenges. And you'll have your struggles. One of the reasons why we don't have twice as many people here today getting baptized um, is because it's hard because of all of the obstacles that the church has put up for people to come and give themselves to the Lord. We, we've, we've put up obstacles before them. Right? We have. And what I need for you to know, if you're not having a conversation while I'm talking, what I want for you to know, what I want for you to know, is that Jesus has made this thing real easy. You know, um, it's amusing to me how we often see Christians who are so uptight trying to perfect their, um, their, uh, their Christian behavior modification. So uptight. You know, um, think that if you, if, you, if you break a little dance, you're, going, you're, you're not going to make it into the kingdom. All right? You know what I mean by the uptight. We, when I was growing up, we even had church police. These were the deacons who wanted to make sure that you weren't violating any part of the law while on the church premises. No matter that you see them on Wednesday night coming out the liquor store with a brown bag. But even for them, Jesus says, don't trip. I got this. Because none of us, none of us will be able to stand before God and say, look what I have accomplished. We are saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. What does it mean? What it means is when it comes to salvation, there's only one requirement that the Lord has for you. You accept the gift. That's all. You accept the gift. It is the gift of God. And then the Apostle Paul, knowing human nature, said on the back end of that, lest anyone should boast. Right? That's what he said. Lest anyone should, nobody can talk about how much they studied, how much tithe they returned, how many Sabbaths they think they kept. No, that's not how salvation works. It is a gift that you receive. When you have received that gift, what you receive is a life that measures with the life of God. A life that takes you into, into eternity. We can't even conceive of what that is. That's what you get. That's what you get. So today as I close, there's somebody in this audience that should be here with these candidates for baptism. And maybe nobody ever explained to you like I just did, that salvation is just a gift that you receive. We are prepared to, to help you today, if it's your decision, to receive the gift of eternal life. Jesus never asked anybody um, if they uh, if, if, if they were going to give Bible studies, if they were going to go to Sabbath school. You know, he, he never, he, Jesus, the only people that Jesus asked to follow him was his disciples. He healed folk and said, go your merry way. He was altruistic in the, ex, in the exercise of his divinity. Today, he has a gift for you, and that is the gift of eternal life, if you will receive it. I'm not asking you if you still cuss. I know some of y'all do, because I've heard it. <laughs> Huh? He's not asking you if you have gotten the victory over all of your habits, some of you who still smoke, some of you who drink alcohol. I'm going to talk about all these things in, in this series. He's not asking you if you have a perfect life. He's not asking you if you're worthy. He's not asking you if you keep all the rules. Those are none of those questions, none of the above. His question to you today is, will you receive the gift? Now, if you have not received the gift and you've heard this message today, and you want to receive the gift. Now, let me just make a clear distinction. I'm not asking you necessarily to come right now. But if you want this gift of eternal life, just raise your hand wherever you are. God bless you. God bless you for having the courage to put up your hand. God bless you. Is there anybody else who wants this gift? You want the gift of eternal life. Not, a, not the gift of nine to five, drag. You know what? One of the greatest sins in this world is when the alarm clock rings and you haven't finished sleeping. That's a sin. Isn't it a sin? You better believe it's a sin. 
It's like I want to throw that clock in the wherever, right? But, but, but today, Jesus invites you to receive this gift. Is, is there somebody else who, you know, maybe, maybe you're, you're not that certain, but you do know you want the gift, right? It's like, it's like that car or that house or that education or that position that you want. You may not be ready for it, but you know you want it. That's all I'm asking you right now. Is there anybody else? You want that. You want that. You want the eternal life. Just raise your hand wherever you are. I want eternal life. All right, so let me try this a different way because I understand what's going on here. And as I told you all, church, when we make these appeals, those of you who know the Lord need to be praying because people are standing at the precipice of life and death. Now, let me ask this question another way. And I'd like for everybody to respond by putting up your hands. How many of you would prefer not to go to heaven? Just raise your hand. How many of you would prefer not to go to heaven? Just raise your hand. Wherever you are. All right, so let's try this again. How many of you would like to receive the gift? Raise your hand. All right, you see, you see how the human mind works? You all see that? So, so look. I, I don't know what else to tell you other than it's yours for the asking. That's all I can tell you. It's yours for the asking. If you want it, he'll give it to you. He will not hold, withhold, he will not withhold any good gift from those who ask. Isn't that what the Bible says? Yes. So I've made this simple for you. I've made this simple for you. The question really is that some of you have apprehensions, you have objections. Well, I don't want to do it just yet. Well, I want to have a little bit more fun. Yeah, well, I don't know if I can abide by all the rules of the church. Let me tell you something. When you get to the kingdom, there's no door over which hangs a sign that says Baptist, Seventh-day Adventist, Methodist. So I'm, I'm simply saying, understand that these rules and principles, while they may serve a purpose, the objective is the kingdom of God. We need to be clear about that. So now let's try this again. A little one last time and then we're going to move forward with our baptism. Please bear with me. Please raise your hand if you would like to go to heaven. All right, you may lower your hand. Please raise your hand if you would not like to go to heaven. You don't want to go to heaven. I just can't stand it with all that church music and... <laughs> Yeah, all that veggie meat. <laughs> Don't let me start on that chicken again. You know they're not going to be slaying any lambs and chickens in the kingdom, right? All right, so this is what I want to tell you as we move toward baptism. More than you desire heaven, heaven desires you. You may not be as valued as you should be here. Remember, I told you everything that God makes is purposeful. But God wants you. He values you. His plea to you is that you are engraven on the palms of my hands. That's how much I want you. I sent my son to hang on a cross for you. That's how much he wants you. And he's only saying to you, if you will receive this gift, then all that I have, is yours. I have withheld nothing. You will be like me. That's all I had to say today. Is there anyone, by the way, who would like to join these today? Just raise your hand wherever you are. If you'd like to join these to go down in the watery grape of baptism and to come up in the newness of life to receive the gift of eternal life. Is there anyone today? In these closing moments, is there anyone? Who has my appeal? Come sing this appeal. I want you to think about the questions that I've just asked you because tomorrow is not promised.